Good morning. We will call to order this September 10th, 2019 meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. Would the clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Cerna? Here. Peters? Here. Frost? Here. Natoli? Here. Kennedy? Here. And you have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, September 13th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting is also broadcast live on KUBU Radio on 96.5 FM. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any local library branch. <coughs> Members of the audience wishing to address the board may fill out a speaker slip and hand it to staff. When the chair calls your name, please come to the podium. Also, silence your electronic devices at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, for your consent matters, items one through 42. Uh, for item eight, you are adopting an ordinance amending Title II, Title Three, Chapter 3.3, Section 3.30.010 of the Sacramento County Code relating to miscellaneous finance tax collection fees. You waived reading on this on uh, August 20th. You're also adopting uh, an ordinance for item number nine, amending Title II, Chapter 2.01, Section 2.01.016 relating to fictitious business name statement fees. Waived reading on that on August 20th. Um, I do need a motion to drop item 31. This is the Auburn Boulevard Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvements uh, Award of Bid. Can you tell me why? I don't have that information. I, I do have that. I, it's with our um, bid proposal. We need to go back, and there's some issues that have come up, and County Council is reviewing it. Okay. Is there a motion? Okay. We have a motion. Motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. And that concludes the clerk's notes. Okay. Is there any member of the board that has any questions, comments on the consent items? I do. Yes, Ms. Thank Peters. You. Um, let the clerk have the record reflect on recusing myself on item number two for potential conflict of interest. Um, and then I'd like to make a comment on item 36. Okay. Item 36 is related to uh, phase 2A Arden service area pipe and meter installation project plans and specifications. I understand this is uh, not, we'll be seeing this item again, but um, uh, I have a meeting set with um, next week with, with um, Water Resources to explain the bid more. I am uh, just want you to know I'm going to be very interested in how this is going to be better than phase one, the implementation, which I, my opinion was very poor. Um, I'd like to understand the optional bid for pavement restoration and why it isn't included in the uh, bid itself and um, some more information about the newsletter as to how they're going to communicate with homeowners and probably some more but that's to start so okay. if I don't get satisfactory answers I'm going to ask you to pull the item uh, before awarding the bid till we get it straightened out understood okay Okay, any other comments or questions? Is there a motion? We have a motion on the chair will second. Please vote. Unanimous vote and let the record reflect that Supervisor Peters recused from item two for a potential conflict of interest. <clears throat> Next item. Okay. Item 43 is a presentation of resolution recognizing Sacramento County Sustainable Business of the Year Award recipients for 2019. Ms. Livingston. Yes. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, Board Chair um, Kennedy and members of the board. Good morning. Jim. I'm June Livingston, and I supervise the Business and Environmental Resource Center, Burke. We are here today in honor of National Pollution Prevention Week, which is September 16th through the 22nd, and we have in our audience today the 2019 Sacramento Area Sustainable Award winner um, award recipients. 26 years ago, um, the board 
had the vision to create Burke. And what BERT does is we provide free and confidential regulatory and permit compliance assistance to businesses. The Sacramento Area Sustainable Business Program, which is administered by BERT, has become the region's benchmark for achievable sustainable practices. To date, we have certified just a little over 600 certified businesses and have award recipients of 130 since the program began in 2007. <clears throat> this program awards ceremony would not be possible without the support of our funding partners, which are the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality, Quality Management District, Regional SAN, SMUD, Sacramento Regional Solid Waste Authority, and the following county agencies, the Environmental Management Department, Building Permits and Inspection, Planning and Development, the Department of Water Resources, and the Sacramento County Airport System. This year's award recipients have gone above and beyond um, to promote sustainable practices, and they stand out as models in the Sacramento region. By highlighting the voluntary efforts of these award recipients have taken to improve sustainability in our region, we hope that other businesses will follow suit as well. This year we honor six recipients in the following areas transportation and air quality, energy and water conservation, pollution prevention, solid waste reduction, and green building. The Sustainable Business Awards Ceremony is scheduled next week on Wednesday, September 18th at the Golden One Arena in the grand entrance between 8 and 10.30 a.m. At this time, I would like to invite Supervisor Kennedy to say a few words and to pre present the six recipients with board resolutions to honor their sustainable achievements. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Jim. The Sacramento County Board of Supervisors supports a clean, safe, and healthful environment and wishes to recognize that September 16th to the 22nd is National Pollution Prevention Week. The six Sustainable Business Award recipients are excellent examples of organizations that made a commitment to environmentally friendly practices. By focusing attention on pollution prevention, Sacramento County will meet the challenges of this century for economic competitiveness and environmental protection. Sacramento County Board of Supervisors wishes to honor the sixth award recipients for implementing pollution prevention measures, conserving resources, demonstrating environmental excellence, and proactive leadership. We also have a resolution for uh, Burke staff uh, recognizing uh, the, that September 16th to the 22nd is National Pollution Prevention Week. With that. <clears throat> Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Once each award-winning organization is named, please come to the lectern, provide brief remarks, please no more than one minute, to receive the frame resolution, and have a photo opportunity with Supervisor Kennedy and myself. After all the resolutions are presented and the closing remarks are made, a group photo will be taken with all board members behind the podium. So, here we go. In the transportation and air quality category, the award recipient is LSA Associates Incorporated. LSA Associates Incorporated is a 100% employee-owned environmental consulting firm serving multiple markets for more than 40 years. In the area of transportation and air quality, uh, they've joined the local Transportation Management Association, the TMA. They offer telecommuting opportunities and flexible work schedules. They make commuter and ride sharing available to um, all their employees. They actively promote bike programs to employees, provide customer bike racks, plant shade trees and parking lots to reduce the heat island effect, and they subscribe to this uh, Spare the Air to promote the, that program to their employees. They use non-toxic and low or no VOC office supplies and paints. Please join me in, rec in welcoming Associate Sherry Winch. I just want to thank the board and the community for this acknowledgement. Um, our office is very proud of um, receiving this acknowledgement and gaining sus a sustainability acknowledgement. So thank you.
In the solid waste reduction category, the award recipient is Nugget Market Incorporated. Nugget, um, the Nugget family is uh, committed to working towards a greener, more sustainable future in every store. They've developed a Green Guru program, a team of sustainability specialists in stores to help them achieve their environmental goals. In 2018, they diverted roughly 6,000 tons of waste from being disposed at landfills uh, by recycling, cardboard bailing, and providing food donations to those in need. The EPA defines zero waste as a 90% conversion rate. Nugget Market is well on its way to achieving that goal. Please join me in welcoming Sustainability Coordinator Shay Robinson. Thank you, Supervisor Livingston. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. And thank you to the Board of Supervisors and the community for this resolution. Nugget Markets is excited and proud to be accepting this resolution. In the energy conservation category, the award recipient is Nestle Waters North America Sacramento Factory. In 2018, Nestle Waters partnered with SMUD to ensure that 100% of their Sacramento facility needs are served with renewable energy, making them the only beverage company in Sacramento and the first Nestle Water plant in North America to do so. So bravo to you. In total, the agreement with SMUD will allow them to eliminate approximately 7,093 tons of metric, metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions each year, the equivalent of removing more than 1,519 gas-powered vehicles from the road. The facility includes 263,000 square feet of production, warehouse, and office space with 34 employees. They bottle under the Arrowhead and Nestle Pure Life brands. Please join me in recognizing factory manager Paul Karbowski. Let's see, we got three. Paul Karbowski, maintenance mechanic John LaRue, and utility mechanic Hector Padilla. Uh, first off, thank you to the board. Uh, thank you, Burke. I uh, would not be remiss without thanking SMUD for the, the uh, very important partnership we have with the factory. Uh, and also want to make sure I thank the employees at the factory. Uh, they're the ones that made it happen, changing behaviors, doing the right thing, caring about the environment. So thank you very much. In the pollution prevention category, the award recipient is Commerce Printing and Marketing Solutions. Their mission is to live green and print green. From soy-based inks to 100% recycled paper to biodiesel technology, they use only non-toxic vegetable-based inks that are far more environmentally friendly than traditional inks. The ink products are biodegradable and even more bright and vibrant than traditional inks. An example of this is right outside the board chambers. The Sustainable Business Poster advertising our award ceremony next week was done by Commerce Printing. Commerce Printing and Marketing Solutions also partner with Performance Chevrolet and Interstate Oil to use biodiesel vans in their fleet. It is a non-toxic, low-emission fuel derived from renewable sources. All paper trimmings, plastics are collected and recycled. They hate to see anything go to the dumpster. Please join me in welcoming CEO and President Gil Caravantes. Thank you, the board. Thank you, Bert, for the assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the green building category, the award recipient is Urban Elements Incorporated Design and Development Works. 
2417 J Street is a powerful example of, in, of urban infill, mixed use, and pedestrian friendly project located in Midtown Sacramento. It is the first multifamily mixed use new construction project to eliminate combustion in the residential units and power solely by electricity. Urban Elements worked with SMUD Savings by Design program and collaborated with SMUD subject matter experts to maximize the sustainable potential of the early design, including imagining the design as an architectural ecosystem, orienting the site so that views from the east, north, and south Minis excuse me, minimize exposure to the west, meeting the impacts of woo, mitigating <laughs> the impacts of the hot summer sun. The absence of combustion means that the all electric residences are expected to save over seven tons of CO2 per year, and residents will enjoy improved indoor air quality. Please join me in, in uh, welcoming President Julie Young. Thank you to uh, Burke and the board and SMUD also for nominating us for this award. We were both surprised and delighted. Thank you. In the water conservation category, the award recipient is Fulton El Camino Recreation and Park District. This past June 14th, the Fulton El Camino Recreation and Park District held a ribbon cutting ceremony to unveil their latest energy efficiency improvements. These projects are part of an ongoing effort of the Park District to reduce operating costs. SMUD incentive programs proved to be useful in helping secure product funding. One of the three proje projects included a new irrigation control system. The Recreation District installed this new state-of-the-art cloud-based irrigation control system for the six parks. This system allows ske proper scheduling, including weather data and testing using an application on the park <coughs> district's employees' mobile phone. This eliminates watering on rainy days and allows monitoring and testing using only one employee. This new process saves water, electricity for pumping water and reduces maintenance costs, a sustainable trifecta. Please join me in welcoming Board Chair Laura Lavalley and General Manager Mike Grace. Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of the Fulton El Camino Board of Directors, General Manager Mike Grace, and all the employees that work for us, I appreciate your recognition as a local steward of our environment. Can we give our award winners, our award recipients, we're using the word recipient now, uh, a good round of applause. In, con in conclusion, the Sustainable Business Award Ceremony will be next week, Wednesday on September 18th at 8 a.m. at Golden One Center in the Grand Entrance. I encourage everyone to attend. The uh, attendance is free of charge and it will include a light breakfast. If you're interesting, interested in registering, uh, please go to Eventbrite and you will find the Sustainable Business Awards Ceremony. At this time, we would like to invite all recipients to, become, to come behind the lectern for a photo with all board members and this would conclude our presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
One, two, three. Item 44 is the presentation of resolution proclaiming September 2019 as a National Food Safety Month. Marie Wooden. Good morning, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. My name is Marie Wooden. I'm the director for the Environmental Management Department, and I'm joined this morning with Kelly McCoy, Division Chief for our Food Safety Program. And I want to thank each of you for declaring September as National Food Safety Month. In addition to recognizing the Award of Excellent winners for their efforts in maintaining excellent food safety practices. By recognizing these winners, this acknowledges our excellent health and safety work that both the restaurant owners and our inspectors achieve working collaboratively together as a team, reducing foodborne illnesses in Sacramento County. Sacramento County continues to remain statewide, below statewide averages for foodborne illnesses. Chair Kennedy, if you would like to come down to the podium, we would like to receive this important resolution and also obtain a photo. Thank you, Marie. I, um, I'm not going to go through all the whereases, but this is a resolution on behalf of the Board of Supervisors uh, recognizing National Food Safety Month. I think that anybody who works with uh, our EMD folks realizes that if you get one of these green placards, it's no joke. Uh, I mean, I, people in the public always ask me about it. It's one of the more uh, uh, areas that people are most interested in because it affects so much, so many of us on a daily basis. But uh, they ask me, you know, is it real? Is it, is it stringent? And, and I can tell you, having been on ride-alongs and having uh, worked with your department uh, throughout the community that uh, you get a green pass from Sacramento County, you deserve it. And uh, so this, as much as we're here to recognize the great work that these uh, businesses have done, I think it's also a good opportunity for take a moment to say thank you to our own staff for protecting and keeping safe the people of Sacramento County. So thank you very much and I'll present you with this resolution at this time. Thank you. Okay, so Kelly McCoy will be doing our presentation. Good morning, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. We, this is EMD's favorite time of year. We get to celebrate all the restaurants that do such a fantastic job. Um, as all of us know, uh, restaurants are one of the most highly regulated businesses, particularly in California. So um, it's really an honor for about 11% of our uh, restaurants that we inspect actually get this award. Uh, luckily, we have five uh, award winners today that will be receiving their award in front of the board. So I'd like to start the presentation. Just a little bit about our food inspection program. We have uh, 7,400 food inspections that are conducted, excuse me, food permits that are um, issued every year in this uh, county. So we have 7,400 facilities that our inspectors have to make sure that are upholding food safety standards. We conduct 19,600 inspections every year to make sure that they're in compliance uh, with 33 consumer protection inspectors. This is a good time to share a little bit about what else our consumer protection inspectors do, just so everybody's aware. We obviously respond to complaints, 
uh, foodborne illnesses. We make sure the commercial pool and spas are sanitary, our body art facilities, employee housing, detention facilities, noise complaints, storm water, business recycling, lead illness investigation, waste tires, and tobacco retail inspections. So all of those activities get done while we are making sure that all the restaurants are safe as well. Uh, in addition to um, you know, the awards that we issue, we, in order to help people comply, we provide free education. Uh, we have food school classes in English, Spanish, Cantonese, Korean, Russian, Vietnamese, and Punjabi. Uh, this last year we had 922 attendees representing 209 facilities. A little bit about this year's Award of Excellence criteria and, and winners. There were 5,145 facilities that were eligible for the Award of Excellence. The criteria, which is very stringent, no major violations found during the last three regular unannounced inspections. So this is where the inspector just shows up. So it's nothing that they can plan for. So that means that they're operating like this at all times. Uh, limited number of minor violations. 598 food facilities earned this award. Uh, representing District 1, Supervisor Serna's district, is uh, Cannon, located at 1719 34th Street. We have executive chef and owner Brad Checky, and he's here to receive his award from Supervisor Serna this morning. So if you'd like to come on down, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, thanks to the board for uh, you know acknowledging all the hard work that that we're doing. Thanks to the EMD, obviously for um, not only their acknowledgement but um, the mentorship also of uh, of helping keep our our place clean and running running smooth. Great. So thank you. Thanks, Chef. I'm gonna say a few words and then we'll take a photo here. So I just wanted to add a, f a few uh, uh, personal sentiments about uh, a recent experience at Cannon. Uh, I had the great fortune this past weekend to. I actually uh, help host a, a dinner um, at uh, Cannon Restaurant. And I have to tell you, not only is it safe eating, it is delicious eating. <laughs> um, I would especially uh, like to point out their heirloom salad and their chicken drumsticks, which are exceptional. So again, I want to uh, congratulate Cannon Restaurant uh, uh, Chef Checky and also owner Clay Nutting, who's here as well, for uh, really leading the way in terms of food safety in Sacramento County. Okay, representing District 2, Supervisor Kennedy's district, we have Hang Fat. We have um, owner Tay Mack and his team to come down and receive the award. The restaurant is located at 7802 Gerber Road, and uh, we're happy to have them here this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all at the director. I got a move very exciting for food safety for 22 years. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just want, how, how long have you been in business? Uh, 22 years. 22 years, that's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, it's a phenomenal restaurant uh, with a, obviously a family atmosphere. Uh, we like to call it in district two, the other fat restaurant. So <laughs> <laughs> congratulations, keep up the great work. <clears throat> Thank 
Great, representing District 3, Supervisor Peters District is 19 Handles, located at 4235 Arden Way. And we have owner Olga Polidnik to come down and receive the award. Good morning. I would like to say thank you. We are really surprised and honored to be receiving this award. And I would also like to thank our staff. They do work extra hard to make sure that our place is clean and safe. Thank you. Representing District 4, Supervisor Frost. We have Visconti's Italian at 2700 East Bidwell. We have Executive Chef Frank Visconti, who's also an owner in ba Batiste Visconti, and we'd like to invite them down. I just want to thank everybody that was involved in, in voting us and recognizing us for all the hard work. It uh, obviously wasn't possible to anybody you know, without you all in the community. And I want to thank everybody. It's absolutely humbling, and we absolutely appreciate it. Thank you so much for this award. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Thank the board. Thank everybody who's involved. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that when I went to visit Visconti's, before I went to visit, I knew this was an outstanding restaurant because they have a reputation that precedes them. Everybody knows about Visconti's and how good their food is. And congratulations for leading out in food safety, but also in good tasting food. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. We'll see you soon. Yes, you will. <laughs> see you later. Representing District 5. Supervisor Natoli, we have Walnut Grove Pizza Factory, 14127 River Road, all the way from Walnut Grove, drove down this morning. So I'd like to welcome owner G. Singh down, please. I would like to thank everyone. Thank you, the board, the Environmental Health Department, and my staff. Couldn't do it without them. Thank you, guys. Well, I would like to certainly offer thanks uh, to uh, our environmental management department, certainly to Marie and Kelly and all the folks uh, who carry out the uh, program requirements, but certainly to congratulate all the winners this morning and uh, all of those obviously participate uh, in the program. And uh, over the years, I know we've had the opportunity to move throughout the <coughs> uh, 5th District and we've had folks uh, in Rancho Cordova and Elk Grove, and Laguna, Galt, Isleton, and this year, direct from downtown Walnut Grove, we have G and uh, his uh, uh, fine establishment there. And I know that in talking with him <clears throat> at the time we presented it out in his restaurant, uh, obviously it's a family operation, uh, like some of the others we saw this morning, and one that he uh, <coughs> puts a lot of his time and effort and certainly work into, but uh, it's a, a good food for the stomach, good food for the soul, and I know it's a gathering place there in, uh, uh, in, in the Walnut Grove and Delta community. And uh, again, uh, wanted to congratulate uh, him and his family and certainly all of his employees for again for a good tasty food but also obviously a very uh, healthy and clean environment so congratulations thank you, you. you bet. Once again, we'd like to congratulate all the award winners. Um, this is not an easy award to get. Uh, EMD really appreciates their commitment to food safety. 
and appreciates that with all the competing priorities that food safety is a priority in all of these establishments. And this concludes our presentation this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Marie. Item 45 is the public hearing on the benefit category change and levy of increased service charges for the Carlisle Estates Unit 2 subdivision within Zone 1 of County Service Area Number 1. Okay. Good morning, members of the board, and anything short of breakfast is going to um, pale in comparison to that last presentation. I know I'm really hungry. Uh, good morning again. My name is Dorothy Kodani, and I'm a senior civil engineer with the County Engineering Division, and I'm here to present the item as was was just read into the record by the clerk. The Carlisle Estate subdivision is located near Power Inn Road and Stevenson Avenue, and the, the tentative map proposes 11 residential lots. In response to an entitlement condition of approval, there was a request submitted to initiate the benefit category change process for county service area number one, which provides street and safety light services. A notice and ballot were mailed to the property owner on July 26, and this item proposes a change from the current category of street and safety light residential, which carries with it an annual service charge of $17.88, to an enhanced street and safety light category with the annual residential service charge currently of $49.64. So if there are no questions from your board, we recommend the first three actions, which are to open the public hearing, consider all written oral testimony, consider all objections or protests, close the public hearing, and direct the clerk to tabulate the return protest ballot. Okay, are there any Thank questions you. from the board? No, then I will open up the public hearing. Howard, did you mean to fill out for this item? Yes. I, okay, all right, I, I figured as much. But <laughs> okay, uh, is there any other member of the public that would like to address this issue at this time? We will close the public hearing and the clerk proceed. All right. <coughs> There's one ballot. Uh, this, the legal owner is Vintage Homestead LLC. Uh, this is the site address is 8021 uh, Icoca Way, Sacramento, California 95828. The annual service charge of $49.64 per residential parcel, and they are voting yes. Thank you, Flo. If, um, if your board directs so, there are a few read ins on the resolution that I'll do. and. Yep. Have you um, move forward? So as far as in the resolution, section two reads, at the close of the hearing, the board has received zero written protests, which the board finds and determines to not constitute a majority protest. Section three, at the close of the tabulation, the board had received one protest ballot, totaling 100% of the total service charges to be levied, of which 100% was in favor of the change of benefit category and 0% was in opposition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? <clears throat> and Chair will move the item. Second. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for item 46, this is the public hearing on the benefit category change and levy of increased service charges for the Garfield Townhome subdivision within zone one of county service area number one. Thank you, me again. <laughs> good morning again, same series, different episode. Uh, good morning again, members of the board. My name is Dorothy Kodani with the County Engineering Division and I'm here to present this item that was just read into the record by the clerk. The Garfield Townhome Projects is located on Garfield Avenue, north of Auburn Boulevard, and this proposes 14 high-density residential lots. Again, in response to an entitlement condition of approval, the request was received to initiate the benefit category change process for CSA 1, which provides street and safety light services. A notice and ballot were mailed to the property owner on July 26, and this item proposes a change from their current 
category, which is street and safety light non-residential with his annual service charge of $124.72. The change would um, propose the enhanced street and, light, street and safety light category, which would carry with it an annual service charge of $28.96 seven cents to each of the 14 residential lots. And again, if there are no questions from your board, we request that the board open the public hearing, close the public hearing, and direct the clerk to tabulate the protest ballot. Any questions or comments from board? Oh, then I will open the public hearing. Is there at this time anyone in the public that would like to address this issue? Please come forward. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Would the clerk please proceed? Received one ballot, uh, and the legal owner is Jeremy Jager. The site address is 5856 Garfield Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95841, with an annual service charge of 80 cents per frontage foot, and uh, he is voting in favor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, I'll um, read into the record the fill-ins for the resolution and have your board um, proceed. Again, in the resolution, section two, at the close of the hearing, the board has received zero written protests, which the board finds and determines do not constitute a majority protest. Section three, at the close of the tabulation, the board has received one protest ballot, totaling 100% of the total service charges to be levied, of which 100% was in favor of the change of benefit category, and 0% was in opposition to the change. Thank you, is there a Thank motion you. on the resolution? Ms. Frost? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 47 is the annual update from Sacramento County Medi Medical Dental Advisory Committee. Good morning, board. Uh, good morning, staff. Good morning, all those in the audience. Uh, my name is uh, Terry Jones. I'm a general dentist. I practice here in Sacramento County. Uh, I'm a volunteer as well. Uh, in that volunteer capacity, I serve as a commissioner on First Five Sacramento, and I also serve as chair of the MECDAC, or the Medical Dental Advisory Committee. With me today is Deborah Payne. She's the vice chair of the Medical Dental Advisory Committee. Uh, she's uh, County, Sacramento County Public Health Program Planner for the, uh, and was responsible for the grant that secured over $11 million in funding for the Every Smile Counts Dental Transformation Initiative, which she will speak about later in this presentation. Also with us today is uh, Ranjid Dhaliwal. Uh, Mr. Dhaliwal uh, is a Sacramento County Public Health Epidemiologist who will present the data portion of our presentation. Okay. The purpose of uh, MCDAC is to provide oversight and guidance to improve the dental utilization rates, the delivery of oral health and dental services, um, including the prevention and education component for both the dental managed care and the fee-for-service section of the dentistry in Sacramento County. We've been in existence since 2012. Our scope of work dictates that we provide both verbal and written input to the Department of the Healthcare Service, to the Board of Supervisors, and to the First Five Commission annually. Um, as you can see from this slide, we benefit from a diverse membership that allows for broad representation across a multitude of stakeholders and beneficiaries. Um, the accomplishment for this uh, 2018 included uh, working with stakeholders on strategies to improve the utilization rates by Medi-Cal dental beneficiaries by 5% per year for three years as set by the Board of Supervisors in 2016. We worked with the Department of the Healthcare Service to improve the data transparency and its timeliness and the reporting that, uh, of a new data portal center by the Department of Healthcare Service. We supported the Department of Public Health's dental uh, director's uh, development of a strategic 
statewide oral health plan. We participated in the development of the Sacramento County Oral Health Strategic Plan. We participated in the dental transformation, uh, developing rather, and implementing the Sacramento County Dental Transformation Initiative, um, the local health pilot, Every Smile Counts, and we were involved in the Center for Oral Health's Early Smiles Sacramento Project. We work collaboratively with the uh, Department of Healthcare Service, with First Five Sacramento, with the County Public Health, with the DTI partners, including the dental plans, to address the performance measures of the managed care system and to meet the utilization targets. We monitored uh, the impact of an increasing number of Medi-Cal beneficiaries, both children and adults, to ensure timely access and utilization of their dental services. We recruited the beneficiaries to provide testimony for the Little Hoover Committee, Commission rather, hearing on March 22nd, 2018, and the target goal that they selected for 60% utilization for the um, fee-for-service and managed care system. We provided regional stakeholders the opportunity to bring dental-related issues for discussion and problem-solving and actions at our regular meetings. In our capacity to provide you with the most recent data, utilization data rather, Ranji will go through the next series of slides for you. Good morning, one and all, and thank you for having us today. The slide above visualizes utilization in the form of an annual dental visit amongst Medi-Cal beneficiaries with full-scope Medi-Cal benefits, no share of cost, and continuous enrollment for at least 90 days in the period of interest. For data labeled as in a year between 2013 and 17, the period of interest is the given calendar year. However, state fiscal year 17-18 data were used in lieu of 2018 calendar year data as the latter were unavailable at the time of this analysis. From 2016 to 17, the utilization percentage grew 3.9%, lower than the 5% target. Similar growth is not evident when comparing 2017 with state fiscal year 1718. It must be noted that there is a substantial period of overlap between 2017 and state fiscal year 1718, and roughly half the data from state fiscal year 1718 are preliminary and due to um, the nature of Medi-Cal reimbursement are subject to potential change. That being said, we don't believe there will be significant changes once 2018 data are finalized. Sorry. This slide is set up in a similar manner as the previous, but further restricted to only individuals between the ages of one and five. The utilization rate grew 2.2% from 29.7% to 31.9% between 2016 and 2017. But again, that rate of growth was not preserved when comparing 2017 and state fiscal year 17-18. We anticipate improvement in the utilization rate amongst children with the full implementation of the Dental Transformation Initiative. For this slide, only data from state fiscal year 17-18 are shown. These data are stratified by age into groups that comprise children and adults, and then further stratified by provider. In addition, the utilization percentage target of 60%, as set forth by the Little Hoover Commission, is given by the red dotted line, and the combined utilization percentages for all providers by age group are given by the gray dotted lines. In both age groups, Liberty not only had the most utilizers, but also the highest utilization percentage. For the state fiscal year 1718, utilization for individuals aged 1 to 20 is 36.7%. The corresponding statewide fee for service figure is 48.7%. And the figure for ages 21 plus, uh, individuals aged 21 plus adults is 21.7% utilization. The corresponding adult figure for statewide fee-for-service utilization is 22.8%. Thank you. With this now, we'll have Deborah Payne presenting the final slides of our presentation. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, be before, um, I see Terry came back up to the point. I guess, you know, we've had, we have this presentation annually and, you know, again, I recognize that there's been you know, effort made and you have a population that ages and so you don't, <clears throat> the same one to five is not the same one to five necessarily year to year or certainly over a period of, of, of years. But 
Um, and the statewide goal, 60% utilization, um, and we're still, if I read your chart correctly, the one that's up to right now, that for those 21 over, is 21%, that's right? Yes, that's correct. Um, I so think we're, we're one-third of what the statewide goal is, and you're one-fifth of what it would be before you got to 100%, which obviously maybe not, never would occur, but... That's correct. Um, for the 60% target, however, I believe when that figure was created, the definition for eligible beneficiaries used was different. In that instance, it was individuals who qualified for services 11 out of 12 months of the year, as opposed to 90 continuous months of enrollment. So that's a little bit more of an active Medi-Cal population, in my opinion, um, and their utilization was subsequently higher. So let me just, because in the years past, and certainly you know, some of you have been here for many years as we've talked about this, and we're down, well, we're still, again, still down in the very low 20s, uh, just barely out of the teens with the average on the, on the adults. And with children, we've seen some improvement, and I certainly give credit where credit's due on, on that. And I know Deborah's going to make a presentation, so let me ask you, so what are the obstacles? that continue to prevent people from accessing? Is it, I can't imagine that they don't need dental care. Uh, as a dentist, you, you see a lot of folks, I'm sure. So what is it that continues to drag us down? And we're not unique in the state, state I guess, uh, in some responses, but um, I guess I'm just curious. Because again, we, these stats aren't a whole lot different than we saw 10 years ago. There are some differences, there are some improvements, and I, again, I want to give credit to that. But I, so I guess I just ask you, maybe again, I probably asked this in years past. Is, um, that's a broad question, and I'm not sure I can answer all the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, factors that go into play. I would say, with regard to the statistics, you know, we're looking at, um, to do credit to the fact that when you look at that 20% utilization in the age 21 and over, that's a new population that has entered the Medi-Cal system. So that's uh, just getting started. Okay. So I think the better comparison is, is to go to the side. other yeah. charts and to look at the 0 to 21. Even when you look at that particular system, um, uh, those numbers, you know, our goal was when we talked about it at this past meeting was to give the particular system that we operated under, which is managed care, versus the statewide system, which is fee-for-service, to kind of give the managed care system a period of three years to get up to the levels that the rest of the state operate at, at the fee-for-service. That's still not the case, um, even when we look at the 0 to 21 population. And that goal was essentially to get us up to maybe serving half of the population, right. let alone the 60% that a little Hoover. Um, so, uh, again, the, the concern, the slides that show us is that there's been improvement, to your point. Mm -hmm. It's just not been significant enough to match what our expectations are or what the Little Hoover Committee is. I think there's a number of issues that go into um, accessing care, whether or not we have the education uh, or that we're putting out our message that this chair is available for the adults. We're starting to do that. Deborah will talk about that a little bit in her, uh, you know, the kind of programs that she's doing with the uh, community outreach, both for the children and adults. But we're trying to, you know, make sure that that message is out, that uh, full dental benefits for adults are available and that they can access that. We also want to make sure the, uh, the community has heard the message that, you know, how important oral health is, especially especially the preventive uh, measures that are taking place. And that's why we did the virtual dental home to kind of reach them in, an, um, in unusual places to make sure that they can access that care. Um, and then also make a medical dental collaboration, which again, Deborah will talk about, uh, that will encourage the pediatricians in the medical office where they see them to encourage that, hey, this is an important factor when we um, to see that, you know, you can't be healthy without having your mouth healthy. Deborah, you want to add? I'd just like to add another uh, item to that, and that is that First Five Sacramento funded a study to get at that question specifically. Why, given the benefit, why aren't parents taking their children? It came down to parent fear that they had an adverse experience when they were a child. They didn't want to put their child through it. So we were really emphasizing parent outreach and education in the DTI, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, so in the survey, um, was that a scientific survey or was it just you know, done 
relative to folks that you were able to ask the question of when they came through the, <laughs> the doors. I guess I'm just curious, so with a bad experience, basically folks are saying, you know, um, it's, it's better for my child to have a toothache or, you know, bad dental health uh, versus taking them to the dentist and, you know, with something that was traumatic for them, I guess, as a, as a youngster. Um, that's the choice they're making? Uh, no, well, well, we're working with the parents to really let them know that things have changed, that you, the, the uh, dental experience is not as frightful as it was when they were a child, maybe. And it's very important <laughs> to have the early intervention and prevention to keep those cavities from forming in the first place. Mm. Yeah, I just don't want to uh, leave that characterization that it is uh, a frightful experience. I think um, fear is one of the components, I think, for, uh, and for a variety, not just the low-income population, not just for the Medi-Cal dental population, but for anybody. And so, uh, but despite the fear, there's also transportation issues, there's also, you know, just overall understanding of the importance of preventive health, and the fact that those factors still weigh on a private dental insurance company issues with private people accessing care, as well as with fee-for-service, as well as with the Medi-Cal dental. It doesn't excuse low utilization rates. So no matter what those factors are, I don't think it's still acceptable that few of our people see it and access utilization of uh, dental care than, say, the statewide average for the same population. Thanks. Supervisor Serna. Thank you. Um, appreciate the, the information. Um, I note the, the footnote on this chart, though. I was wondering if, does anyone know what the number of um, individuals is that uh, did have 90-day continuous enrollment but split the years? Sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Do we know order of magnitude, whether it's a few or no? No, we don't. Okay. Well, if you're going to put a, a, a footnote like that in the bottom in the future, I'd suggest that we actually have a an answer for the question in terms of the, the number. I'd like to know it was accurate, um, as accurately as I can, what the, what the actual uh, individual numbers are and the percentages. We, we are waiting. Uh, we depend on the state to release this data, so that's what we're waiting on. Okay, I, if I can, uh, I'll entertain any other questions. I'm just going to highlight our uh, 2019 Medi-Cal Dental goals. Uh, many Medi-Cal Dental uh, members, rather, Medi-Cal uh, Advisory Committee members are involved in a dental transformation initiative and are getting, uh, are actively working with the dental plans to improve the utilization rates. Uh, the Department of Health Care Service is required by law to meet four times a year with MCDAC. Uh, this continues to be a productive in, uh, meeting, and it is, I think, responsible for increasing and improving some of the dental utilization rates and solving some of the dental-related issues. Um, MCDAC members meet two times a year uh, with the Medi-Cal uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, rather, advisory committee to uh, help coordinate between health and dental issues. Um, patients who need general anesthesia continue to have issues with the access to care. Um, we have an all-plan letter that was issued sometime in August of 2015, and it continues to cause confusions and denials of requests for general anesthesia service. The Department of Healthcare Services is working to resolve those on an ongoing issues. Uh, in addition, hospital operating room availability continues to uh, shrink for this population. So that's a concern that we'll continue to work with. Uh, we will continue to support uh, changes to clarify the general anesthesia policy and guidelines with Department of Health Care Service. And finally, uh, MCDAC members are providing input on the state and local Prop 56 implementation. Um, our next uh, series of slides, again, will be uh, uh, introducing uh, the be dental transformation. Before you go there, yes. doctor, real quick, if you can go back, please. Uh, fourth bullet down, I'm just curious, what what effect does the, um, you know, the perceived or, or real experience uh, with discomfort and pain relative to past experience with anesthesia, whether it be general or local, um, how is that, in your estimation, affecting um, utilization? And I think you just touched on it generally, but are we doing any particular messaging to address that particular element, given what Deborah had said earlier? 
now, uh, with regard to the general anesthesia population that are seen, so um, um, this particular population are often special needs populations, so uh, they cannot always access care within the traditional settings of the dental office. Those, if that's the case, if they cannot access the settings, then our uh, only op options for treatment issues is to provide that care in the dental, uh, in the operating room of the uh, hospitals. Um, so that's a backlog, that's a problem. With regard to other, not all of the general, of the special needs populations will require general anesthesia to receive care. That care can be received um, in different settings uh, and usually focus on preventive care, making sure that there is um, good exams, dental exams, uh, preventive services like uh, fluoride varnishes, uh, dental cleanings. Um, and the more we can do in non-traditional settings, the better it is for that particular population. But again, a, a significant portion do require hospital uh, dentistry. We've reached out, we've worked with the, uh, the hospitals to kind of improve that access. Um, it, it's a complicated issue. It seems like it's, uh, I think it goes back in part to the fact that oral health is usually looked as a, uh, uh, less important than overall health, and um, rather than seeing oral health as a significant part of oral health, of overall health, it's kind of dismissed in a way. So if somebody is sick, if they have a toothache, if they have a dental abscess, it's just as important as if you have a brain abscess or any other ones. It can kill, it can cause damage, and so I think once that message is clear to the medical community, to the hospitals, and the importance of having um, regular access to this uh, care, I think it will, it's part of that outreach that we're trying to do. So I, it's a long-winded answer. I don't have all the details on it. It's an ongoing challenge. Thank you. Deborah. Thank you. So um, it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about the Dental Transformation Initiative, where $11 million has come in for dental services in Sacramento County. So what we're funding is three pilots. One, the virtual dental home. Uh, two, the medical dental partnership. And three, community outreach and parent education. We have some real cutting edge services here. Um, the virtual dental home is in 14 schools in the Twin River School District and it, we will soon expand to four schools in the Sac City Unified School District. So that is providing a, a, a dental team so that children are seen in schools where they already are. And the dental team is there, there are presents in the school so the parents get to know them. They can, you know, many parents can't be reached by a, a mail or phone campaign from the dental plan, but if you're a known entity at the school and you can talk and ask questions, then they're more likely to get recruited into the virtual dental home at the school. So this is using teledentistry. There's a registered dental hygienist and a dental assistant and a care coordinator, and that's key. Uh, at the school site to help getting paperwork completed, um, reach out to those parents, uh, help to educate them. And then they also go into the kindergarten classrooms and do a quick exam and um, then rate the kids one, two, or three. A letter will go home to the parents that they need immediate care. And uh, then they help connect them to services. So we're really excited about the virtual dental home. There's also the medical dental partnership. We know that young children are more likely to see their medical provider on a regular basis. And so we're encouraging those medical providers and helping to train their staff to include dental in what they do during the well child exam. And one of the things we heard from pedi pediatricians is that they recommend that the child see the dentist. They don't know whether that ever happened. And we have a special uh, data matching where the health plans, dental plans, are matching up those kids who haven't seen a dentist in the last 12 months. Then the pediatrician knows ahead of time. It gets referred over to the uh, dental. You know, having the, the pediatrician sort of write a prescription. Your child needs to see the dentist. And then the medical provider also knows who that dentist is because, of course, they're assigned in Sacramento County. 
Um, and once the child does go to the dentist, the information goes back to the medical provider. And they're really liking that new development in the system. The third one is the community outreach and parent education, and that kind of um, has two components to it. Um, there's the uh, parents need, as I mentioned before, uh, when to take the child to the dentist and how it works in Sacramento County. So we have contracted with uh, CAPSI to provide online training, and so. Um, parents connect to the parent modules, they're interactive, they're in many different languages, uh, and so that helps with the parent education. The other thing that we had them develop was train the trainer series, because there's over mm, 100 family serving agencies in Sacramento County, and whether that agency provides mental health, housing, whatever their specialty is, Dental will come up at some point, and they need to know how it works in Sacramento County. So staff are able to take that training online without leaving their office and uh, um, get that training by, through the parent modules. Um, so the next, sorry, let's make sure I know how to do this. This is actually the virtual dental home uh, at Hagenwood Elementary. As you can see, the, the, you're able to set up a dental services in a very small corner of the room, as long as there's running water. And you can see the child's not unhappy to be in the chair. This is their first introduction, many of the kids, to dental, and it's in a not pain-free and non-scary environment. So we do have little data on DTI. It wasn't fully implemented yet in 2018, but with first quarter 2019, all three pilots were fully implemented. So we're just beginning to get that data. So um, six dental teams were trained uh, by UOP, and they're the ones that developed the virtual dental home. Um, and we bought six sets of equipment because they have handheld x-ray, they're called nomads, uh, to use out in the school. They're amazing devices. That way, the dental team can take the pictures of the child, send it back to the dentist. That's the teledentistry part, of course. The dentist is off-site at the clinic, and then he can review records, and they develop a treatment plan for the child. Um, <coughs> We have great numbers coming from the Center for Oral Health Early Smiles program, and um, at the time we collected this data, they had only served 600 kids, but it's mm, approaching 20,000 coming up here pretty quick. So they're a great partner in this program. Um, and then for the Medical Dental Partnership, there's 267 medical providers have been trained. Um, you know, some of the medical providers didn't even realize that they would be able to bill for a dental exam on the medical side. So we uh, contracted with children now to provide that training to the medical offices. Um, let's see, what else do I want to pick out here? Under the Community Outreach and Parent Education, um, almost 7,000 children received a dental message from a community health worker, navigator. Um, we're working with Sacramento Covered to have a dental navigator at the emergency rooms because many kids, that is not the place they should go to get their dental care, of course, but they do seek it. And uh, the dental navigator is equipped with all the correct referral information to keep children out of the uh, emergency room and that they get connected to the care they need. And then um, lots of coordination and, oh, we have a puppet art. I don't know if you've ever seen his presentations, but he de developed puppet shows for the kids in schools that are specific to dental. And he is a lot of fun. Um, we actually had a King's event out at um, uh, Neralto School where uh, a legacy King's player um, and Slamson um, and, and the dental team was there to talk about dental. The legacy King's player sat down and read 
uh, Potter the Otter goes to the dentist, to the kids, with the kids. Each of the kids got to go home with a book. Um, so those puppet shows are really, you know, back in the day when we were learning about um, tobacco education, many times the message really came through to parents when it came home from their children for what they learned at school, that not to smoke, and the seat belts and that kind of thing. So that's what we're using there with puppet art. We're really um, looking forward to 2019 data and coming back to you to report on um, the progress that the DTI has made. And again, I just want to say that we're concerned about the utilization rates as well, um, but it's not fully in our power to change those utilization rates. It's really on the dental plans and the Department of Healthcare Services. But we work both closely with all those people, meet with them um, every other month through MCDAC, and uh, work on issues such as uh, serving special needs kids and um, making sure that the utilization rates really do go up. Supervisor Peters. Uh, thank you. Maybe you said this in your presentation and I missed it, but how do our percentages of usage compare to compare statewide? Well, in Sacramento County, of course, we are mandatory managed care, and statewide it's fee-for-service. But if you compare the two, fee-for-service is about 50%. For individuals age 0 to 20, fee-for-service statewide was 48.7%. Our corresponding figure was 36.7%. Is it the basically the same population of pa the patients? It is. I'm trying to remember, Don, you may uh, remember years ago, didn't we discuss a fee-for-service plan versus the... <clears throat> yes, we, we've had that conversation several times uh, regarding About that. Which is we, better? We weren't, we, yeah, we weren't given a lot of choice. That's the only thing that... Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've, yeah. If I may, Supervisor, I just wanted to offer a comment on that. Uh, under Dr. Bielenson, we have reactivated those discussions with the state on the question of geographic managed care and the issues that we have with it. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that soon, but uh, it has been a long-standing issue. Quite frankly, we haven't gotten a lot of the kind of feedback we'd like to get from the state on that question, but we are actively uh, involved in that along with Sarah Health and other community partners to be looking at that. May I just add on that same uh, issue of uh, the Department of Healthcare Services presenting out a uh, request for information. So they're uh, asking the dental plans and others that are interested in continuing maybe with the managed care system, a letter of interest. A letter of interest. So uh, a couple of the questions they did ask, I think that would be, I think, reflective of the board's uh, concern about utilization as well as the little Hoover Commission's concern was, has your plan been able to see a 60% utilization rate? Now, what they do with that information, I don't know, but it is reflective that they are aware that the Little Hoover Commission has asked that um, at some level of utilization increase should be there. With that letter of interest, then we'll go back, the state will look at that, and they'll present uh, options. They can either continue managed care, they can uh, set standards, requirements, the, by which they will uh, determine who can bid for that particular plan, uh, or they can um, disregard it and uh, go to a fee-for-service. So th that's their option. So they're in that process. Now's the time to engage them with uh, discussions about that, I think. Well, yes, yeah, I, I would just like to, uh, oh, Bruce, see, um, next time we hear this is more uh, discussion of where we fit into what the, the the state averages and let's not lose track of this discussion of managed care versus fee for service because that is kind of why we're having these reports because they uh, we just were not making in enough progress on it and rather than just report on your own numbers I think it needs to fit into um, this other uh, larger discussion. Yes, we did have a, a extensive conversation about this in 2016, and that's when the Board of Supervisors said they'd like to see an increase of 5% a year for three years until 2019, and then make a decision. So um, that's why we're back reporting to you here. 
Okay, but we aren't offered any discussion in the staff report about making a decision between the two or any comparisons um, there. So uh, I guess that's the county executive. It feels like we're losing track of the bigger discussion. I don't, you know, just going back to your question, if I'm I sorry, could. I asked the county executive. I, I think given the data that we have, there is gaps in there that we need to refocus on how we can improve. Mm -hmm. And I'll work with Bruce and with Peter to next time we make a presentation, if there's changes we can make with the state, how would that look like and what's the process behind it? Yeah. Well, and and there's, it seems like there's more money coming in. I think it was mentioned $11 million more this year for this, uh, uh, I forget what you called it here. DTI. It's the Dental Transformation dental. Initiative, yeah, DTI. I, I just, I, I, I'm not convinced by the information we got today <coughs> that putting even more money into it for a program that is not growing fast enough. I realize you can't force somebody to go to the dentist, and it isn't just kids who dislike going to the dentist. Um, uh, but uh, I think that should fit into our discussion of how much it's uh, costing. So, thank you. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Can I just follow up with that? Uh, sure. DTI, the money was given by the state for both fee-for-service and managed care. So it wasn't focused oh. only on managed okay. care. I didn't want to. I, I, I missed uh, that part of it. Yes. So uh, I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Peters' uh, comments. And um, given the fact uh, that Deborah mentioned um, and reminded this board that, um, you know, we kind of set for ourselves a goal, and this is the threshold year uh, during which we were expecting to um, actually do more than just receive a report. What I'd like to suggest is that we not wait another year uh, for another report. And in fact, um, I'd like to have the CEO commit to uh, perhaps um, working with staff to bring this back um, perhaps in the winter, January timeframe. And so we can have a discussion and have a recommendation in the form of a board letter that uh, gives us an opportunity to make a decision of whether or not we want to begin to go down the road of setting in motion fee for service, whatever that entails. I know it's not going to be easy. Uh, I'm not pre prejudging the outcome either. Uh, perhaps there's going to be more robust data at that point that can convince us that uh, it's worth um, staying with what is now a 24-year-old pilot program. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. So, um, you know, I, I, I just don't want us to, to lose sight of that. And I do believe, while it is apples and oranges to um, 56 of the other counties, I believe San Diego, though, is another GMC county. Is that right? LA is a voluntary. OK. So and do we so have any, do we have any data that looks at, looks at that analog for, for comparison purposes? Uh, we certainly can come back to you with that if, in January if that's what you'd like. I think that but would be helpful. We'll, we'll we do don't yet have 2019 data from the state. We're waiting on that. I think what we can commit to is that we will come back January, February timeline once we have the data to have a fairly robust conversation. So we will be back on that. Good. And, and you know, it, part of that conversation should be what's happening at the state level. Um, I, I know that Senator Pan has been interested in this issue for quite some time and helping us out. Um, we also, Mr. Gill and I, had a meeting with the governor's office, and they are aware of the concerns that some have with GMC model. So um, what that looks like as far as if we were to go in a different route, how that would happen, I think would be, should be a part of that discussion. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Item. <clears throat> is it receiving file? Do we need direction about coming back, or is that understood? It's receiving file. Said. Okay, that's understood. Okay. You're good. Yeah, we're good. Item 48 is the authority to implement the collaborative shelter plan, <coughs> transition the winter sanctuary program to a year-round shelter, and prepare a request for proposals to procure a provider to operate the North A campus shelter. 
Good morning, my name is Cindy Cavanaugh. I am the County Director of Homeless Initiatives and I'm here this morning with Ann Edwards, Director of Human, uh, County Department of Human Assistance. We'll make a presentation and then both be available to answer questions. Over the past several months, the county and city have uh, been working on a collaborative shelter plan that is intended to improve uh, the publicly funded shelters that operate within the River District, um, primarily those operated in county facilities, and to focus sheltering and services on the population that is living unsheltered in the River District. The Collaborative Shelter Plan aligns state and general funds from each jurisdiction to competitively procure operators in existing, for existing county facilities. It consolidates this funding to a single administrator for each shelter, but using common approaches and metrics and collaborating throughout implementation. Um, and it does envision uh, implementation that more intentionally connects the sheltering operations to the River District challenges in unsheltered population. Uh, the, the collaborative shelter plan is done in the context of these time sensitive and ongoing challenges, which include uh, the Winter Sanctuary Program. Now we all recognize the very uh, important, valuable, significant efforts that have been made over the past several years on the rotating church model of the Winter um, Program, which uh, includes the faith community, uh, the provider for step communities, and the Department of Human Assistance staff. But there are um, challenges in continuing, and we believe this model is no longer sustainable, uh, stemming from the <coughs> growing fatigue that we've known for several years within the church community, and also the challenges and cost of daily transportation and service provision when folks are transporting so much of the day. We also are seeking to improve our understanding and our influence over shelter outcomes who served, how folks enter the shelter, and most importantly, perhaps, where folks go, particularly if they are going to permanent housing. And despite the number of beds, and we'll talk about that in a minute, in the area, the River District continues to have a large and growing unsheltered population. We have shared this plan with uh, several stakeholders, including the River District uh, PBID, the Continuum of Care, Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency, the, currently the current operators of the publicly funded shelters, and area congregations together. As a recap, there are two fa county facilities. Uh, at North A, there's 80 beds for men, currently with night use only. Uh, connected to this shelter are city and county funded day services and sanitation services which are fairly recent. And then the North Fifth uh, shelter has 80 overnight beds for men and women and 24 beds in adjacent space recently vacated by county probation. So I've mentioned the challenges, but there are also current opportunities. The collaborative investment plan adopted by this board as well as the city and the continuum of care last fall includes about 1.4 million in new state HEAP funding homeless emergency aid program funding to improve the existing shelters uh, in addition to expanding shelters. Um, the seasonal capacity is expanding through the homeless assistance resource teams or heart teams with five of the seven heart groups currently operating uh, winter programs in a 6-1 plan for winter and those seven groups are soon to be expanded to nine heart groups. And then finally, the city and county both have been deepening their direct experience with overseeing sheltering, uh, especially of folks who may not participate in sheltering or other services, and in supportive services, offering those supportive services as well as, in, as, well as the housing-focused outcomes of sheltering. The plan will allow both shelters to be 24-7 and we'll make the changes I've already mentioned, uh, really focusing on engagement and invitation uh, within the River District and delivery or connection to rehousing and other supportive services. To the extent funding is available, additional beds could be added, uh, not expanding beyond the River District footprint uh, of beds, um, so most likely outside of the River District. Um, 
The plan also recognizes, and this is really important, I think, that addressing the impacts of the unsheltered population in the River District goes much more. This is a contribution to, to that, but goes much further than just the sheltering, what sheltering can do, and involves a greater ongoing partnership among stakeholders and under mitigation, these are mostly enhanced city strategies relative to uh, uh, mitigating the, the impacts. Can I just ask a quick question? When you say unsheltered in the river district, do you include the actual river banks as well, or do you not? We, uh, no, we do not. So do we have a calculation <coughs> regarding what that, because that feeds it back and forth, uh, folks, you know, migrate back and forth sure, to the river? Sure, sure. There is likely to be migration, but when we look at impact. There, there is, Cindy, there's not yeah. just likely, there is. Yes, um, so perhaps my question is to be determined exactly, okay. not knowing all the flow, but really wanting to impact the visible unsheltered no. homeless in the yeah. river district. Granted, I, yesterday we were on a tour of the Lower American River and, and I had a <clears throat> chance colleague to, to see what was out there yesterday, but as we looked down the streets heading down <clears throat> 12th <clears throat> Street or 16th Street. But I guess what my question was is though, so we talk about the unsheltered population in the River District, those that are along A or or A or wherever, whatever the streets are, but recognizing that right adjacent, if you didn't see them camped there, adjacent to loaves and fishes or to other shelter facilities, that they're immediately proximate, maybe only a hun hundreds of yards away uh, along the river. And I guess if we're going to start looking at the population to be served, it would seem to me that we, what we're trying to cope with, and again, I'm not trying to get you off your presentation, but just in reality, because one of the things that <clears throat> seems to occur to me is either we uh, expand or contract, add capacity, adjust capacity, that <clears throat> the pushes that come from, uh, from that ebb and flow, what we see along the riverbanks, or adjacent to the levees, uh, but also in the river district and adjoining neighborhoods. It's not just river district, but, and so I guess I'm just trying to get some s sense about that because what we count in the river district, you have a number of beds, all important points. But if we're trying to get a handle about those folks that are congregating in, in not just the immediate area, but certainly in the very proximate vicinity, I think that's an important We element. have started, I think okay. I answered too quickly. Yeah. We have yeah. started looking at what the tiers of invitation will look like with that being, uh, it's, it's possible, maybe even likely, that we would not fill the beds with the River District invitations. So we have expanded what the second tier and third tier would look like. That that with flow, I think we will be reaching. Okay, and, and just one other point here, and, and maybe after you and Ann complete, we can get to a little deeper, but as you talk about transitioning from the winter sanctuary model as we knew it last year and as this evolved over time, um, what happens though when the elements get harsher is that folks, and whether they're along the streets, in the alleyways, and somebody's front doorstep or down at the river, uh, is that folks, uh, you know, when it gets really cold and really rainy, they, you know, more folks seek shelter, and, they're in, 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 and likely there's a concentration of them, not likely, there is a concentration in the River District. I guess what I want to know, and what I still isn't clear to me in this whole plan, because there's no really, except for that we have this 24-7 year-round operation and better coordination, and we've learned some things, is that how do we adjust to that force that is called winter weather here in Sacramento, and then what that does with folks then who can no longer tolerate that, who then are seeking shelter and have either participated in a winter sanctuary, have filled up others, you know, other beds, uh, whatever they're assigned to. And yes, we're adding some capacity, city's been working on that and so forth, but how do we, how does this help us with that surge, I guess? Uh, and, 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 and it wasn't clear to me, and maybe you have that, maybe that's in your presentation. Well, um, let's yeah. see if we cover it. I, okay. we, there'll probably right. likely be more conversation as we okay. finish Thanks, it. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. So I've covered many of the expected outcomes of this plan. Um, it's not perfect, um, but we do hope to more fully utilize existing beds. I haven't mentioned that one. Uh, we also hope to have increased flow by a closer collaboration and attention on rehousing services um, so we can serve more people with the uh, same number of beds. And uh, I think I've mentioned most of the others. Uh, we are looking at common shelter standards community-wide 
and a coordinated oversight. So this touches a little bit on the, cur the current and near term expansion of beds um, within the city and county, countywide. So current bed capacity within the River District is 400, about 475 beds with 179 beds outside of the River District. And this uh, inventory is detailed in attachment one. And this translates to about 73% um, of all the beds in the county are in the River District. In looking at the near-term expansion of shelter, uh, we anticipate an expansion outside of the River District of to 671 beds for a total of 1,146 beds. Now, River District will represent about 41% of the bed capacity. This is the last um, slide, and then Ann's going, going to make a few comments. This uh, summarizes the $3 million investment between these two shelters, 1.3 million of HEAP and County General Fund now going to North A, and 1.7 million of HEAP and City General Fund now going to North 5th. Ask Ann to come up. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Before you leave the slides, and eat, the, I note that there's a bubble here. It's the sanitation program uh, under County North A campus. Uh, does that include um, the coordination and work by EMD when it comes to vermin control? Um, no, it currently does not. Um, we know there are issues there right now that are being addressed. It includes the use, uh, it includes the availability of toilets at the North A Day Use Center. We're now going to look at that as more a, of a campus with the shelter and the day services um, and continue to offer with, uh, I should say with also with city investment, the san those sanitation services. Okay, so does that mean you're gonna add bathrooms or porta potties or what? We have uh, been operating bathrooms of, um, and I may have to look to someone else for all the details, but fairly extensive hours at North A that are overseen by First Step communities who are operating the day services. So we currently operate, and it's, it's very well utilized, um, those, those sanitation services. Okay, I, so um, I know a colleague of mine have both been contacted by um, Council Member Harris about his concerns over um, rats uh, that uh, he attributes to um, feeding, um, uh, well-intentioned feeding that um, I, I assume would uh, attract um, you know, rats and cockroaches and other things. Um, and I know that the, I believe the city is engaged with an extermination program um, to deal with that, that issue. But uh, that is something that I want to make sure we get in front of in terms of kind of this new day of cooperative effort in the, the River District. Um, when it comes to keep, especially keeping uh, mice and rats under under control as best we can. And I know EMD is well aware of the situation. They're doing everything they can within the law to uh, at least advise folks that would otherwise be intent on um, uh, trying to feed folks that are, that are hungry. Uh, but that is, you know, as I think we can all appreciate it, if you don't get ahead of something like that, it becomes uh, a public health not just nuisance, but a real public health risk, uh, in you know, in the very near future. So I think that that has to be part and parcel of what we're doing here. And I think that falls into those efforts I mentioned that are broader collaborative efforts beyond the sheltering. So definitely recognized um, as an issue. Thank you. So just to be clear on that, just crystal clear, whether or not it's included in this sanitation program, we, the county is currently aggressively working on that particular issue. If I may, on that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, both EMD, as Supervisor Cerner mentioned, but also our public health, Dr. Kisiri has been working with the city on this in a partnership uh, to address that issue. Great, thank you. Good morning. Ann Edwards, morning. Department of Human Assistance. I just want to say that I'm, DHA is very excited about this collaborative shelter plan. Um, it is not the be all end all, as you can tell. It is um, a way of repurposing some funds um, that their previous use was no longer available to use. And so I think it's going to be a good plan to have 
both shelters with um, some consistency in operation and all the other things that go along with it. I do want to take a moment to thank um, First Step Communities um, for having operated the Winter Sanctuary Program for the last couple of years. Um, and I also want to thank area congregations together and all the churches that have participated because I know that this has been um, a real heavy lift for them over the years and it has become uh, more and more challenging to get um, churches to participate every night and uh, we really think that this plan is a way of addressing that in a way that continues to shelter those that are um, in the River District and potentially elsewhere and also provide the services that they may need to get them into permanent housing. Um, I also want to address the winter question that um, has come up. So. I actually think we might be able to serve as many or more people with this shelter because we will be offering services which will allow people to move on from the shelter into housing, therefore we can get more folks in to shelter. Uh, but when the weather hits, um, we will be collaborating with the OES to open up warming centers. It's, I mean, we do this every year um, so that we can address those that are outside during the cold um, winter months. Um, and if I can interrupt there, yes. Supervisor Cerna. You may be getting to this, but uh, in terms of your your thanks that you're um, offering to various groups, but uh, I just want to make sure, Ann, that this, uh, this effort and all the thoughtfulness that's gone into it has been shared with and vetted with the River District. Yes. With the, with the PBID. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The, the we've had. Uh, I have not personally. Cindy, my staff, the city have worked very closely with and talked to the PBID at length. Absolutely, and they are in support of this plan. Thank you, Supervisor Frost. I can wait until she's okay. Thank you. Actually, I'm done. Oh, you are. <laughs> I am done. I also want to thank the Heart programs actually because they are going to continue to operate, um, and there's even some expansion there, and so we're we're very appreciative of those programs as well. Hi, Ann. Hi. Uh, I I wanted to ask on the <coughs> 1,100, little over 1,100 beds. What is the timeline for expanding to that? I might be that might be a question for Cindy. Is there a timeline? Well, line? for Cindy or maybe Emily from the city, because a lot of those um, expanded beds outside of the River District are the city-funded beds. Can you speak to that, Emily? Thank you. Good afternoon or morning, Supervisor Frost. I'm Emily Halkin, Homeless Services Manager with the City of Sacramento. Um, Anne is correct that I think the majority of the expansion are confined within a few city initiatives, so I'll give you an update on where we're at. Um, we will be um, bringing to council on September 24th contracts to expand um, uh, scattered site shelters very similar to the scattered site shelter program you already operate. That will be adding, um, I believe, 40 new beds to the scattered site model. We'll also be bringing forward that same day, the 20 fourth um, contracts with both St. John's program as well as City of Refuge for small expansions of family shelter programs. And then the largest two components are the 200 bed shelters that were just approved by council last week, one at the Meadowview site and one at the Broadway um, Alhambra site. Um, staff is furiously working to get together all of the um, development plans and funding, but we have been um, aspirationally um, challenged to open the Meadowview site this winter um, and the Broadway site has some more um, robust site work that needs to happen so it'll probably be more like the spring of 2020 okay so you're you're moving quickly pretty quickly we're moving as quickly as we can now yes. um, I had a question that I I um, I wanted to ask regarding the winter shelter uh, because I know that I, I'm not sure where the the homeless folks came from that were being housed within the past county winter shelter program. I know each of the hearts operates in their own little jurisdiction, and I'm not sure. I know you were transporting. Were most of those people coming from the River District? Um, no, most of the queuing was at the River District, if not all of the queuing. Oh. Um, was at the River District. It has varied in past years to have outlying areas, um, but with the expansion of Heart and, and just because of the cost, et cetera, the queuing has mostly occurred at 
uh, the river at, okay. at the North A site. Okay, so that makes this make even more sense um, because the question I had was, was, will there be people that are homeless who have historically been able to access the county um, winter shelter that will be just left out hanging or is there a plan to refer them over to the heart programs if they're not in the river district so they can be assimilated within the heart programs absolutely we will we want to in continue our collaboration with heart as you recall one of the county initiatives funded uh, navigator that's assisting two of the uh, new um, heart groups um, with their outreach but we see um, that as a, a growing collaboration um, especially during the winter months and then last I just wanted to say ask uh, Ann mentioned we can no longer use the money I thought it was more like this just isn't working anymore because the faith community wasn't able to continue down this it was getting tiring but it was it was it a matter matter of we can no longer use the money that way anymore no you're or correct did it I was, misunderstand it no you didn't so the the faith community has indicated that they are um, it's very difficult to get churches to want to continue to do this it's a lot of work I've it, done it <clears throat> it's a lot a lot of work and they have done a yeoman's job over the last several years so it's not that we can't use the money for that it's just that it, it I may have misspoke but it's really just that it's not available to us now because of the uh, weariness okay and I, I lied I have one more about the charitable feeding I wanted to ask um, what you in your report you mentioned you're gonna then uh, continue to address the charitable feeding what did you mean by that well, there, there has been ongoing work amongst the parties mentioned, uh, uh, county EMD, county public health, county DHA, myself, as well as the city, including city law enforcement and Emily. We have been um, brainstorming, working on how to reduce the impact and actually reduce charitable feeding. I think this current issue brings that even more to the forefront. Uh, the tools are limited, education is one, et cetera. So we will continue to work on um, addressing the charitable feeding impacts and, and the fact that folks really, uh, there is a lot of trash generated. I don't know if Emily wants to add to that, but a lot of issues beyond the rodents uh, in terms of trash, in terms of too much food um, that's happening. And so if, if we can bring folks in, we are looking for roles for charitable. We are going to partner with charitable organizations. We know they are coming from a place of wanting to help. If we can harness that within the shelters, either through uh, additional uh, food that may be needed or other ways that we can really harness the charitable um, impetus or the charitable inclination. Yeah. It, you know, what you're doing really seems like it makes a lot of sense and i want to thank all of you for working your way through it and with us too so thank you supervisor Natoli. yep certainly i would add my thanks to you know leadership that both uh, cindy and ann have provided and all the so many county staff and city staff that uh, in respective cities i mean the other cities have been involved as well um, I guess I want to still ask about this question about the winter surge, and I've heard Cindy's response. I heard you address it in part, and I guess we don't know. Um, and I, I guess I would couple my question on that piece. Then when I see that family beds, um, and I heard what Emily said about apparently some work they're doing with St. John's and with uh, another provider, and I guess I'm curious when <clears throat> we see the survey and obviously we see the single persons that are in it the, the point in time count but and we talk and we hear so much about families living in their cars and you know all the efforts to you know, deal with that maybe in a different format i guess I'm, i i i asked that question about families family beds but also then how do vouchers fit into this which again those are very temporal uh, but they do bridge over for days if not um, in some cases maybe longer but um, I, I guess I just you know as we're evolving this and you know you know dealing with what has obviously been a, a growing 
um, set of issues. I'm, I'm curious about where families, because families are still at the same number of beds that um, we, we had currently, and, and we know there's a deficit there as well and the ability to provide for those that are in need. So this plan um, was not designed to address the family issue. It was designed to address the singles issue in the River District and the previous folks that we were serving in the Winter Sanctuary. We will continue to treat families the way we do right now. They are a priority. Um, if we cannot find a shelter for a family and they are at risk, we will give them a motel voucher. I mean, all the things that we do now and have done in the past, we will continue to do for families. They are a very high priority for us. So do we have the same amount allocated for vouchers as we did last year relative to funding, or has there been an increase in that, or? I would have to, um, I may misspeak here, but I think yeah. it actually went up this year because we overspent last year, and so we accommodated for that in our budget this year. Is that right, Eduardo? Well, it should be at the same. Okay, I, I did misspeak, so at the same. At the same as it was last year? At the year. same it was last year, but we did, um, anyway, we, we actually don't stop giving them when we run out of money in that line item. We move things around and try and figure it out because we, we're not going to leave No, I know, and that's your credit, so, and, yeah. Yeah. So, um, how, I guess, how are we going to compare this? Again, we're going you know, to live it day by day in what we do and who we provide for, but um, certainly over the years we've talked about what happens in the wintertime and that that, again, some people who might not otherwise be, be coaxed or take opportunity to go into the shelter, they don't, find any, they, they don't find the conditions outside to be tolerable, so they come knocking at the door. They participate in winter sanctuary. They end up in the shelters. And I guess with no additional bed capacity um, it, it, <clears throat> to degree in the winter shelter beyond what's contemplated, although the city obviously is looking <coughs> to, to deal with this uh, with their uh, efforts. I guess you know, I just, how was that conversation addressed within the, the context of what you were working on here? I mean, we're, your focus was on the River District, but recognizing that there is this additional, and it's folks who may otherwise stay unsheltered, and whether they're living in the streets or on the river or somewhere else in the community, they, then they seek shelter. And is, is there any, um, you know, evidence that we're going to see a surge? You know, I don't want to say, say that and, then, you know, and, and it's not true, but my sense has been is that it's, it's not just coaxing 100 people to come with you at any given night during the winter, it's that there's obviously this demand and then we see them camped out, they seek shelter together um, in other places that maybe they're not evident during the summertime as much, so. So it's certainly hard to yeah. predict a couple yeah. of things. It's hard to predict the weather right. and it's hard to predict um, what the need will be in light of this plan. So, and it's very difficult to compare one to the other because we're comparing apples and oranges because the winter sanctuary program was essentially shelter overnight and that's it. And right. so now we're gonna be providing enhanced services. Uh, they can stay indoors all day and the likelihood of moving folks on to another opportunity for housing, whether it be permanent housing or transitional housing, then lets more in. So we're constantly having conversations about how to manage the homeless population in general, regardless of the weather. And as you know, there's not enough. And I mean, I, I can't even, just, uh, I want to add that over the last couple of winters, um, one thing that Winter Sanctuary has done is more engagement. Uh, we went to the River District uh, PBID and we uh, worked with them to say, how can we invite in? It's not like folks just come. They need to have uh, that trust, not only to the Winter Sanctuary, but to the day services. And I would say those practices have been successful and we will continue them with these sheltering. So it's, it's also a matter of building that relationship and trust in offering folks, whether it's shelter or other pathways out of their homelessness or to services. So we're going to look for more street engagement from our shelter <coughs> providers. Okay. <coughs> Well, I appreciate the responses again. I know there's not answers to some of these because, you know, again, we don't, we're not certain about <laughs> exactly who we're attempting to serve. We have a you know, general idea and who's, who's out there. Um, and I guess one other thing I wanted to ask about, because I know we put additional emphasis with, with county services is trying to make available um, a slots for folks who have addictions and uh, to have expanded bed capacity, assuming folks are willing to seek, you know, um, you know, a, a treatment uh, or to, to come to grips with that. These are 
low barrier, I get that, but your, the idea is just to transition folks to help them with that. Do we have sufficient capacity, um, you know, recognize there's a general population need, but also with the homeless that that, you know, uh, that that's a big piece of it, certainly mental health is being another part of it, but I want to ask particularly about substance abuse. And I think you're aware of a, I think a really important change that uh, Department of Health Services made, it's underway, we'll extend to these uh, campuses, these shelters, which is to have on-site access clinician for both mental health and alcohol and drug services. So that is a change that is already seeing impact for, for, for services for this population. By being there, they can um, engage in the right way rather than seeking out services. And then we are also looking for the expansion, the Medi-Cal organized drug mm -hmm. delivery system right. uh, expansion to really change this dynamic <coughs> so that eventually we will get to where inpatient services can be on demand, which will really be critical for um, reaching this population. So if I understand what you said lastly, that with, with that expansion, so the clinician that would be available on site would be able to, if somebody said, I'm ready to go in, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, done drugs long enough and they're in a place in, in their that immediate time that they're willing to, to, to go and you can you could place them. Is that what you're we saying? We are not there now. No, I know. There is a, yeah. about sixty day I think waiting list. I would uh, don't rely on that completely, but it is lessening as the expansion gets underway. Okay. And that is the that is the hope and plan. Okay, thanks. And and it's really not that hard to predict the weather, it just takes a Sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Mr. Cern. Thank you. So just to uh, continue the discussion a bit uh, that Supervisor Tolley introduced on addiction, um, because I know that this is uh, primarily a presentation and a decision for the board as re regards uh, shifting of um, uh, sheltering uh, locations, number of beds, uh, better collaboration with the city, which I think is, is outstanding. It's, um, I think, long overdue. Um, but when it comes to um, addiction, there's nothing in this presentation. Um, is there a forthcoming presentation that we're going to receive anytime soon that s serves as kind of a complement to perhaps what we're doing, again, in collaboration with the city that is specific to not just addiction, but methamphetamine addiction. Yeah, if and I may, super, uh, let me, let me oh, complete my thought. We have um, a methamphetamine, a county methamphetamine task force that is doing a lot of work right now in terms of how best to um, uh, consider um, a more robust uh, uh, programmatic infrastructure at the county to deal specifically with methamphetamine addiction. Part of their strategic plan development process uh, includes uh, focus on how uh, methamphetamine is contributing to the circumstance of homelessness, how it continues to be kind of a plague within that uh, population. And so um, what I'd like to um, <coughs> offer and suggest is that, uh, again, perhaps early next year, we have um, a very dedicated conversation in public uh, and hopefully by that time, the task force has completed most of their work on um, their strategic plan about what we're going to do differently, better when it comes to methamphetamine addiction specifically. I remain very, very convinced uh, that it is such a huge contributing factor that uh, puts, people's, puts people, whether it be individuals or family, in the throes of homelessness and it keeps them there. Um, all you need to do is spend time on the, the riverbanks, as Supervisor Tolan and I did for half a day yesterday, and you can kind of see for yourself <clears throat> what's going on. You talk to our park rangers when you ask them specifically about, uh, you know, just it's their anecdotal information, of course, but, but the type of addiction that they're encountering in the homeless population that are occupying the, the parkway, 80% are methamphetamine addicted. Okay, so, uh, and this is a very, very different drug with very different effects than any other drug that out there, different than opioids, different than marijuana. It has a permanent effect on people's psychology. Um, it's easily accessible, it's cheap, and it has a long high, right? So it is, um, I think, has to be treated um, in parallel 
with what we're doing here, um, and it's good work, again, doing here in terms of the shelter part, but there has to be something similar with regards to methamphetamine. So I'd like to su suggest we, we do that, Bruce, take advantage of the work that, that uh, our drug and alcohol folks um, are doing on the subject. And then the, um, the second comment I wanted to make is that in attachment to, um, I'm glad you put this uh, table together, um, you can kind of see the, um, track the number of beds, how they're funded, and generally the political um, geography of where they're located. And um, you can see that, um, while I know this is really a discussion about the River District, so obviously there's going to be um, a lot of uh, County District 1 identified here, I just want to make it clear, I've been very consistent with a message, whether it be working with my colleagues at the city council or uh, friends at the River District, that I still continue to believe that the River District is over-concentrated with services. Um, it's juxtaposition geographically with the lower reach of the American River Parkway continues to be very problematic, which should be obvious to everyone who wants to enjoy that part of the parkway. Uh, but I also want to be consistent in, again, mentioning the fact that I am extremely willing and, and very um, encouraging that we continue to find other shelter locations in the same supervisorial district. And that's why I've been supportive of the, uh, the city's efforts with their, their sprung units or sprung structures, uh, whether they be uh, the one located between the Curtis Park and Oak Park neighborhoods uh, and elsewhere. So uh, I just want to make clear that um, uh, I do maintain an objection to over-concentration in one part of the district I, I represent, albeit it be in the city. Um, I think it's very wise that we begin to look at how do we equi equitably distribute these services, including shelter services, across the entirety of the city and the county. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, that's all the comments I have from the board. I do have public speaker slips. Mike Jasky. Good morning, Chair Kennedy, other supervisors. My name is Mike Chesky, representing Sacramento Area Congregations Together. I'm a member of St. Mark's UMC, and I live in Supervisor Peters, District 3. SAC Act supports the City County Collaborative Shelter Plan that would disband the Winter Sanctuary Program and replace it with increased shelter utilization downtown and improve services and sanitation for unsheltered homeless people. Uh, we are concerned that the total number of winter beds may be shrinking, so there's a trade-off between sort of minimal assistance of a larger number of people versus greater assistance for a fewer number of people, the Supervisor Natoli has mentioned. Um, notwithstanding that concern, I think the plan before you is superior to winter sanctuary. It's year-round, not seasonal, it's 24-7, not nighttime. It's got a central location where the people actually have been residing, and it's not, therefore, wasting money busing people throughout uh, the county. There will be, more importantly, there's a full range of supportive services to the residents, which has not been feasible to provide in the setting of winter sanctuary in church basements, not enough privacy, not enough contact time with the clients. Um, and we think that the expanded services in the vicinity of the shelter as uh, Mr. Waters has been running in the last year or two is certainly a good idea. Uh, at least for the moment, that's where the people are, and so that's where the services need to be. Uh, we're, uh, we are also concerned that state HEAP money is the predominant basis for funding this. And although there's very rosy expectations of further rounds of HEAP money from the state, we are concerned that if the state's uh, budget comes into some other circumstance, that there's a vulnerability here. So we have faith that the county and the city will, in some manner, pick this cost up were that to happen. Thank you for taking the step to improve shelter and services for homeless people. Many more steps are needed to actually solve the problem, but this is a good first step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jasky. Stephen Waters. You got your card in last there. 
Good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Steve Waters. Uh, I'm an executive director of First Step Communities. I'm here to lend our support, myself and my board, for the Collaborative Shelter Plan. As mentioned earlier, I think by Cindy, we administered the Winter Sanctuary Program for the last three years. Just want to make a few comments about those three years. Dur during the last three years, we were adding services as we learned more and more about the program. It culminated in a, a joint process with the city and county where we opened the North A Street Rehousing Program, which provides case management and sanitation services in the area there. During the pilot for that, we housed or moved indoors 53 people. In this first year, which is just about to conclude, we've finished 11 months now, we've added another 122 uh, total. So by the end of <coughs> September, we will be somewhere between moving indoors 175 and 200 people from the River District streets. We do want to lend our full support to this concept of creating the North A Street campus. We think that one of the th things that has held us back from housing or moving indoors even more people is the <coughs> fact that we've had to go out and find them through outreach and bring them in, where if we have an adjoining uh, shelter, I think our engagement's gonna go up a little bit, and I hope our numbers will go up correspondingly. So we will be enthusiastically competing to run that campus. Um, I wanna mention one other thing. Uh, sanitation services came up, uh, the, the idea that we open our restrooms. We now have those restrooms open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week, and we average between 9,000 and 10,000 uses per month. And it's definitely made a, a difference in the River District, which I've heard from uh, different business owners in the area. And finally, we will be if successful in this RFP, partnering a lot with ACT and the other faith-based community members that we've worked with these last three years, they're still enthusiastic about being involved. I think the facility stress is really, and, and the demand on volunteers for overnights has been what drives part of the change. Thank you. Thank you. Howard Lawrence. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy, members of the Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> My name is Howard Lawrence, and I too am a member of Sacramento Act, Area Congregations Together, and uh, St. Mark's United Methodist. It was about five years ago, I think, we first approached the board and talked about the need for funding for the winter shelter. Thanks to the leadership of Supervisor Serna and others, that's happened. But over, over the years, <clears throat> we have had discussions with you and with county staff that this was supposed to be a temporary solution to a crisis that developed in 2008. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to <clears throat> take my time to, one, incorporate and support what uh, uh, Mr. Jasky presented to you, but also then to take the opportunity to thank county staff for meeting with us, responding to uh, you know, our requests. We appreciate it. We will do what we can to help make this model work. Uh, there's much more to be done, but we do appreciate uh, the efforts that's been made with this matter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Howard. Th thank you, Howard. That is the final slip I have from the public, so we'll bring it back to the board. Is there any comments? I'll move the it? item. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Thank you, everybody, for all your hard work on this. Item 49 is the response to the 2018-19 grand jury final report. Uh, Supervisor Candy, members of the board, uh, there's three items in front of you today in response to grand jury. Typically. We do not have this as a timed item, and the reason we have it as timed is that specifically the grand jury asked for a board reaction, not from a departmental reaction, on homelessness and oversight elective officers. 
So, uh, Mr. Ferguson, our Chief Fiscal Officer, is here to take comments on what would the Board's pleasure be. You had the report, and Brick can walk you through um, um, what the findings are, or you can give us feedback on it, and we can take it in any sequence you would like. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the Board. Um, uh, as Mr. Gill indicated, uh, each year the grand jury issues a report that includes findings and recommendations related to different issues involving different public agencies, often including the county. Uh, in their report, the grand jury identifies who specifically is required to respond to their report on a particular issue. The required respondent must then indicate whether they agree, partially agree, or disagree with the findings and whether any recommendations have been implemented, will be implemented, require further analysis, or will not be implemented. This year, the county was tasked with responding to findings and recommendations with regard to three issues. The organizational structure for addressing homelessness in the community, the effectiveness of Board of Supervisors oversight of the sheriff and district attorney, and uh, the impact of recreational marijuana on Sacramento County's youth. As Mr. Gill indicated, typically when a grand jury report involves the county, a county department is required to respond or a county department and the board are required to respond. In those cases, we generally bring a consent item to the board with the department's response and the board is asked to approve or agree with the department's response. In the case of the grand jury report before you today, that is what happened with regard to recreational the, the recreational marijuana issue where the Department of Health Services was required to respond and their response is included in your packet. But as was indicated with regard to the homelessness and board oversight of the sheriff and district attorney issues, the grand jury only required a response from the board of supervisors, which is why this has been scheduled as a timed item. To assist you in responding to the latter two issues, we have provided some potential responses to the grand jury's findings and recommendations with the understanding that your board may want to make revisions that better reflect your views on, this, uh, this mat on these matters. We are bringing this item before you today so that, you, so that any revisions you make to the response can be brought back to you for final review and approval on September 24th, which will allow you to meet the required responses deadline of September 28th. Uh, with that, as Mr. Gill indicated, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions, but um, we're really uh, offering this to you as your opportunity to review the responses that uh, we've identified as potential responses and make any revisions you think appropriate. Okay, I'd like to actually kick off one, uh, and this is, uh, it's related. Uh, it's, it's perhaps not uh, directly uh, addressing the report, but it, it is certainly related, so hear me out. In uh, recommendation number one on page two of attachment one, uh, it, it, it basically the, the concept in my mind is better coordination of services um, by all the providers. Now, I've had uh, numerous conversations with uh, city leadership, including city staff, uh, elected officials with the city. Uh, as well as uh, the uh, board members from Sacramento Steps Forward, as well as staff from Sacramento Steps Forward. Uh, I've had numerous conversations with the gentleman in the room here from ACT on this particular issue. And I think it really underscores the need to have some kind of a policy uh, driven body that can provide, help provide that coordination to give more direction from a if, if not regional, at least a countywide basis and from other jurisdictions along with the city of Sacramento and the county of Sacramento, the other cities who are, who are involved. Uh, to the, the, I would really like to revisit this um, and what was discussed between the city and the county, uh, in my opinion, and we have not brought it to the board, but I would like to. Uh, and because it embedded in that was a mechanism for us as policymakers to be able to have an impact on this coordination. But there was also plenty of backstops to protect uh, the various jurisdictions and their interests. Um, it's on the surface somewhat benign in some ways, 
but to me it's very obvious that one of the things that we have lacked is this coordination and I think that that goes to the heart of the of the concern that the grand jury talked about. And Supervisor Kennedy, uh, we will bring that item back. We'll work with your office to put that on the agenda and have that conversation. Thank you. On the second area on page one of attachment two when it comes to the elective officers, uh, in the discussion of the SOCAB, and I think that I have been um, clear of my position that the SOCAB uh, is not, does not have the teeth into it that I would like to see. Uh, but that being said, there is a, an error in the response in which it talks about the, uh, what makes up the SOCAB. And it says, consists of five members appointed by the Board of Supervisors and five members appointed by the Sheriff, as well as members appointed by the incorporated cities within the county that choose to participate. We actually changed that maybe two years ago. And we changed the makeup to be 5-5, five, five, and then we included a representative, either you or your designee, and we also, I'm sorry, the CEO. Uh, we also uh, added the OIG will be a part of that. And That's so, correct. That's, we did not catch that. We will absolutely make that change. Thank you very much. That's uh, true. Mr. Natoli. Yeah, just thank the chair for, that was part of what I was going to address on, on the, uh, <clears throat> section on the uh, oversight uh, was the makeup of the SOCAB, so you <clears throat> you already properly pointed that out. Um, I wanted to, uh, I'll come back to the, <clears throat> that part of the uh, report in a moment, but I wanted to go to the um, um, health crisis uh, with Sacramento County youth relative to recreational marijuana. And <clears throat> on the last page of attachment three, <clears throat> page six, last paragraph talks about, excuse me, the next to last paragraph under, <clears throat> The um, County Department of Health Service response and recommendation has been implemented. It talks about funding and it <clears throat> says that youth programs did not receive Prop 64 funds in the 18-19 funding cycle. I don't know whether that's anticipated in 1920 or not, but part of this obviously is getting uh, the message out and I appreciate the uh, description of what uh, I think both the Sacramento County um, Alcohol and Drug Services uh, is providing, but also the County Office of Education and other community providers, including obviously with school districts and other youth-oriented organizations uh, uh, and prevention organizations <laughs> are doing. But I would think that there might be an opportunity here for the county um, to, in the event that uh, the issue is, is as portrayed, but not just in this community, but I'm sure in other communities as well, <clears throat> that why wouldn't we say that rather than just saying moving forward it's unknown when these funds would be received and how they would be distributed, why don't we take a more proactive role? role. We ought to talk about what our active, um, role is as a county, certainly to the leadership of this board if they so chose, but in working with our uh, delegation, our state delegation, uh, and, and, uh, and whether it's through you know, Bruce and Dr. Bielinson and, and uh, others, uh, I, I just think that we need to be more proactive, that if monies aren't being allocated, why? But secondly, then we ought to, is, if, if they do become available, then make it known that, you know, not only our grand juries pointed this out, our board has responded, we're doing things uh, with a host of, of um, partners in this community to, to address the issue uh, that we ought to be more proactive. So I guess I would like to, to the, the statement ought to maybe read a little, a little differently than that. So Point taken. Okay. Um, and then just going back to the section on the, on the oversight, um, on the uh, portion, um, <clears throat> not just with the construct or constitution of the SOCAB, but uh, I guess I'm not real clear um, beyond the stated intent and the fact that we make appointments. In fact, some of those are reappointments are on today's agenda under our uh, board, uh, board nominations and, and uh, <clears throat> appointments. But this just kind of talks to, to, to the verbiage. It doesn't really talk to the realities of, of how that interaction really occurs. And again, I think that uh, that body and certainly its members appointed both by the sheriff and, and by uh, the board of supervisors can have can play this role. And it may be part of that to talking about the construct is when the IG and the county exec designee and or the county exec is seated on this body is that we actually have some um, proactive discussion about how we do 
what was said here, um, because otherwise those are nice words, and they you know advise us, and those people who serve with dedication and with an interest. I think that we could be more actively engaged. Uh, again, not imposing you know necessarily the will of this board. Certainly, the sheriff has a role in this as well. But I think as community representatives, and then having two parties, uh, one who will be selected by the <laughs> to the process with the board chair and the sheriff as it relates to the IG and a new MOU that's going to be attached to that. Uh, but also then with UNAV or whoever your designee would be, is to have an active role with our SOCAB and, and to really, I think, take those conversations to a higher level uh, if in, of engagement, uh, if in fact this is what we desire. And so I guess I would maybe <coughs> offer that, maybe that's some of the commentary that we could fill in here today. I don't have anything specific to add, but it seems to me there's, a, there's the ability to use this vehicle uh, and this construct here to, to actually have a, um, a, a broader and hopefully a, 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 an impact on some of the concerns that we heard about in this chambers all of last year or so. I 100% I agree with Supervisor President Atoli on that. Okay. And, and then, uh, and so again, I, I would just offer those comments is that um, under the, um, I guess it's a recommendation two, make sure I get the right, right one here. Okay, on recommendation two, the, um, <clears throat> we are going to, and I know the chair stated during budget last, last week that um, okay, working through the provisions to actually secure another IG recommendation to come to this board, but also the MOU, that that will occur before the end of the calendar year. And that's, it was, so we're saying that to the grand jury, though. It's not just our, our intent, but that's what we, you know, we're, we're going to do that, right? That's the... That's correct. Okay, all right. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Peters. Yeah, thank you. I uh, wanted to suggest we add on uh, attachment three in the marijuana section mm -hmm. um, uh, in the discussion about <clears throat> realignment funds being spent to um, uh, provider contracts further enhance 2.0 efforts. I think vaping needs to be added to this, not just uh, uh, marijuana and the, I mean, Michigan is in the process of banning vaping altogether, the whole state, uh, and there have been many articles in the press the last month or two about the health uh, problems that are being created by vaping with lung infections and kids ending up in the hospital, in some cases dying uh, from infections they receive from vaping. So I would like, it's separate from the grand jury report, of course, but it's more changing, adding to the scope of that section. Okay. And I'm still looking forward to getting your report back on vaping. Yes, we are working on it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so, so Supervisor Serna. Thank you. So just to um, add to what uh, Supervisor Antoli just mentioned about um, the response and attachment to on um, elected officials, um, since the solicitation has been made uh, for us to contribute additional language, I would like to see very specific language added at the very end of that uh, finding uh, where it says, understanding between the sheriff and the county that will allow for a better defined process and procedures relating to IG oversight, comma, and then I would suggest some verbiage that says something to the effect, including um, uh, measures, including new measures for conflict resolution. That's, uh, that is uh, what is at the heart of the uh, memorandum of understanding that, uh, again, uh, the sheriff has been in possession of and the DSA has been in possession of now for months. And uh, quite frankly, <coughs> that is, for, at least for this supervisor, the crux of the issue to avoid what we went through last year. So that, that, that's, I'll let you craft the, the language, but I think that point needs to be stressed uh, in that, in that uh, place. Got it. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Frost. Okay, I uh, wanted to comment briefly on the homelessness uh, regarding the regional conversation, and, and I guess my comment is that if we're gonna have a regional conversation, I would like to see it be truly regional and that all the jurisdictions are involved in that conversation or if it's going to be countywide, it should be everybody that's involved in the conversation. Last time we brought it 
forward. There were a couple of jurisdictions that had been approached, but some had not. I know Folsom wasn't involved in it, so um, I wanted to just uh, make that comment regarding and, and that ask regarding conversations and collaboration. I also wanted to say regarding the vaping, uh, that is something that is legal at the state level. And so um, I'm not sure banning something at the county level when it's when someone can go five minutes or not even leave their home and order it online really has an impact, but might even um, create more um, administrative work for us. And so I would like us to um, ha keep that in mind when we're thinking about that conversation around vaping. And uh, regarding the sheriff advisory and the IG, uh, I, know I felt like uh, first of all, I, I felt like the staff's response to, to this um, entire report was very factual and uh, it was really well done and I want to thank the staff for, for actually um, responding so well. I, I, thought, um, I thought they'd, you all did a great job. I, I also want to uh, mentioned regarding sheriff advisory and uh, um, oversight, the word oversight. I'm not sure that um, the IG or the advisory commission have oversight authority. That's something that is um, really uh, something that we're reminded of even as, as late as yesterday when the legislature um, did not pass uh, AB 1185, I think it was, you know, regarding giving, you know, uh, an outside com uh, citizens commission uh, oversight authority. And so I think if we want to do a better job with our advisory commission, we should maybe work with them. And if we want them to have more teeth, we should work with them, maybe get um, regular reports back, and um, be more organized in our approach to, you know, what their function is in, in relation to, oh, you know, providing input regarding uh, operations. But I think for us to say they have, uh, that we can in, have them have oversight uh, they don't have they won't have oversight over operations we don't have that so uh, those are those were my thoughts regarding the report and I support the staff's recommendation as it stands okay before I go to Supervisor Natoli, just for clarification, it does say attach or adopt the attached reports, but what you're really looking for today is input and you were going to bring it back. Correct. I mean, okay. there's two options. One, if you like it, it right. stand as it is. I we think you've gotten some enough yeah. feedback now that we probably need to. We, we're going to come back on the 24th with suggested language that we're getting from the board members. Great. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, I, I just, because we, again, we got into this last year a bit about, you know, what oversight uh, encompasses, but clearly in the staff response, it's said three times in the next to last paragraph on page one under finding two, board supervisor response. The board supervisor disagrees partially with this finding. The Office of Inspector General contractual provisions have broad oversight powers that include the evaluation of the overall quality of law enforcement, custodian, security services, the authority to encourage systemic change, provides monitoring oversight of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. <coughs> um, if, if in fact that's not accurate, I believe it is accurate, uh, but if that's not accurate, then to the points that Supervisor Frost made, uh, you know, it's not just subject to interpretation, but I believe that those things are accurate. President Tully, that's straight out of the scope of service. Right, yeah, that's absolutely. Right. So that's that, where we got that language. I know, it, that's what I thought. And so I want to be clear about that now because, again, that's what we're saying and that's what this board is called upon. And people can debate what that means. We had a lot of that debate here <coughs> last year in the chambers, but it is clearly oversight. Uh, is it, you know, is it control of? No. Uh, and uh, it is oversight as defined here. 
in, in, in both in the contractual piece of it, but also in the direction by this board. So I just wanted to be clear, because that is, that is accurate. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Supervisor Frost. Yeah, I want to thank you, Supervisor Natoli. I probably didn't state that well. I, I think what I was trying to say is that with their oversight authority, they don't have the ability to subpoena or alter or adjust the activity operational activities of the DA or the sheriff. Right. Um, we do have subpoena power. They do not. Uh, but I think... Um, in their oversight, they can make recommendations and they can help us with improving transparency and communications with, you know, the general public. And I'm not even sure they meet um, that often. So maybe we can do a better job at um, making sure that we they come to to a certain level of commitment on the advisory committee. No, I appreciate your, your your comments, and I was referencing. I didn't say it very well. No, yeah, and I, I was referencing the IG versus the the SOCAP. I think your comments were the SOCAP. So under understood. You did fine. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there any other comments from board members? Did you get what you need, Mr. Gill? <clears throat> yes, I did. Okay. So we'll be back on the twenty fourth with a revised response. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, with that, we can do appointments. Appointments is item 50. Okay. You are continuing to September 24th, the Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee, continuing to October 22nd, Cemetery Advisory Commission, County Service Area 4B, Slough House, Wit Wilton, Casumnes, County Service Area 4C, Delta, In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Committee, the Mission Oaks Recreation and Park District, and the Sacramento County Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board. For your matters today, we have the Assessment Appeals Board, Supervisor Peters, I mean, Kennedy. Chiefs recommend reappointing Morgan Staines, Daniel Dripe, and Teresa Chan. And continue the remainder to October 22nd. Okay, Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Peters. Please continue to October 22nd. And Supervisor Frost. Please continue to October 8th. Supervisor Natoli. Continue to uh, October 8th, please. October 8th, okay. First five, Sacramento Commission, Supervisor Kennedy. Chiefs recommend continuing to October 22nd. Public Health Advisory Board. Chiefs recommend continuing to October 22nd. Did you say October 22nd? Yes. Okay. Sacramento County Mental Health Board, Supervisor Peters. Thank you, I'd like to nominate Siloti as Milash to the family member seat. Okay, and uh, Supervisor Natoli. I continue to October 8th, please. Sacramento County Youth Commission. Supervisor Cerna. Please continue to October 8th. Supervisor Kennedy. Continue October 22nd. Supervisor Peters. Continue to October 22nd. And Supervisor Natoli. October 22nd, we've done, we're doing some outreach, so. Okay. And then we have the Sacramento Environmental Commission. Chiefs recommend nominating Paulina Kolich and continue the remainder to October 22nd. Okay, Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Supervisor Kennedy. Please continue to October 22nd. And Supervisor Natoli. Uh, September 24th, please. And then we have the Southeast Area Community Planning Advisory Council. Supervisor Natoli. I nominate Gary Garfield. Okay. Continue the remainder. Two. October 22nd. Please. Okay, and that concludes your that concludes your nominations. Okay, with that, we, I know we had closed session. I have an adjournment. Does anybody else have any comments, questions? Yes, Mr. Cerna. Thank you. I uh, just want to make mention under uh, supervisor comments, um, I wanted to issue congratulations actually to all of us. Um, the, the fact that um, CSAC, the California State Association of Counties, has uh, acknowledged um, the county's work um, on the RAACD slash Black Child Legacy campaign with uh, with a merit award, 
And this comes on the heels of, again, um, our National Association uh, doing likewise earlier this year. So again, I want to thank uh, my colleagues for all of their support over the last eight years to, uh, to get us to a point where the outcomes that we've sought are coming to fruition. And uh, of course, it's not about getting awards. It's about uh, making the difference that we set out to make, which is to save lives and reduce the uh, uh, disparities that uh, for too long have plagued this community when it comes to uh, the welfare of African American children. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Thank Chair. You for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, you would note on the on the uh, today's calendar. In fact, we're still putting the final touches on it. But the uh, uh, 150th anniversary of the founding of the uh, city of Galt, uh, and uh, this Saturday the uh, community is having a community-wide celebration, all-day celebration for the sesquicentennial. Uh, event um, and it will include a whole day of activities but just wanted to extend the invitation to my colleagues and to the broader public to uh, uh, join in that um, thinking back uh, over the generations that obviously many communities here um, with the establishment of county being over 165 years ago and certainly the founding of our state uh, uh, in similar time frame that cities fall behind some um, uh, and actually they were formed as a city in the 1940s, but uh, as a community were founded uh, uh, 150 years ago. So I'd invite all of you to, if you're interested and don't have <coughs> anything else going on a Saturday, which I know you all do, uh, to, to join with the community uh, throughout the day. In the, uh, and there are actually um, uh, some structured activities at one o'clock uh, in Old Town Galt. So thanks. thank you and congratulations to you and your Galt neighbors. Uh, anybody else? Okay, I'm going to uh, read an adjournment and it's fairly lengthy, but I will remind you it's the first one I've done in five years, so I guess I get that. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to the board today to adjourn in memory of Biba Caggioni. Caggioni. Biba passed away August 29th at the age of 82. Biba was born and raised in Italy's gastronomical capital, Bologna. She grew up cooking the food of her native Emilia Romana region. In 1960, she moved to New York, the hometown of her American-born husband, whom she met while he was studying medicine in Italy. During those first years of living in New York City, Biba made an effort to recreate the everyday meals that her mother used to make, striving to make food an integral part of her new family life. In 1969, the family moved to Sacramento at a time when Sacramento lacked restaurant diversity, especially those serving quality Italian food. Thus, if Biba wanted authentic Italian food, she had to make it herself. After a couple of years of making simple and elaborate meals for family and friends, she was asked to teach a series of cooking classes. The classes were a huge success, and Biba found herself with a brand new career. She even taught culinary heavyweights like Randy Paragary and Patrick Mulvaney. Biba published nine best-selling cookbooks, which combined have sold more than 600,000 copies. Her last book is included in Food & Wine's Best of the Best. She hosted 100 episodes of her internationally syndicated cooking show, Biba's Italian Kitchen. In 1986, Biba opened her namesake restaurant. Since then, the restaurant has received glowing reviews with, with, from Gourmet Magazine, Travel & Leisure, Condé Nast, Travelers, and The Wine Spectator, to name, a, to name a few. Named as Best Restaurant in Sacramento by the Sacramento Bee Food, and wine editor and voted best of the best by Sacramento Magazine readers for the past several years. If I were to name all of the prestigious honors Biba has received over the years, we would be here for an an another hour. But for me personally, my way to honor her is to stop by the restaurant, which, is, which will remain open on a Thursday or Friday and order the best lasagna to be found. <laughs> I adjourn this meeting in memory of Biba Caggiano. Nicely done. Also the best is Saboko. Yes. <laughs>